This man is in a very fortunate position. His seven foot by seven foot room is warm and dry. He doesn't have to pay rent or a mortgage. He's fed three good meals a day without having to buy or cook food. All his basic survival needs will be taken care of for the rest of his life. But this man is a prisoner, and prison is one of the worst punishments society can bestow. Why? Because the human animal is not satisfied with mere survival. Our greatest rewards are obtained when we go beyond survival. has been accused of making man beastly because as a zoologist I've concentrated on those aspects of human behavior that we share with other animals such as feeding fighting or reproducing now, I've done this because I felt we've all too often ignored our biology and only stressed our great achievements the things that separate us from other species but of course these special qualities can't be ignored and in this final program I want to take a closer look at our finer moments and see if we can trace their biological roots. How can we explain in animal behavior terms, strange activities like these. These performances, whether purely musical or, as in this case, deeply religious, are quite different from the ceremonies and rituals of the rest of the animal world. They're not territorial displays, threat displays, or courtship displays. So what are they? Even here, where there is an element of sexual display, the interest lies more with playfulness than with sex. These strange human activities are found in every corner of the globe, wherever human beings have time to spare from their daily chores. It's a deep and ancient part of human nature to be imaginative and inventive. The human species is biologically a creative species. Probably the oldest and most widespread way in which humans display their creativity is by decorating themselves. Nowhere is this more evident than among the tribespeople of Papua New Guinea. Using materials as varied as bird feathers, mud, correction fluid and sump oil, they create the most stunning display of body adornment found anywhere in the world. They themselves speak of the best displays as being glinting, shining or flaming. In other words, the opposite of dull and tepid. Their aim is for maximum uninhibited visual impact. Body adornment may not be so extreme in the West, but it's equally important. Although it's much more restrained, a great deal of time and effort is nevertheless devoted to achieving the desired effect, as this view through a two-way mirror reveals. Sexually, it makes sense to redden the lips, exaggerate the eyes, smooth the surface of the skin, and make the hair look clean and healthy. 
but it's not that simple. If it was, every makeup would look exactly the same. There are hundreds of lipstick colours to choose from, dozens of eyeshadows and countless hairstyles. And when choosing between these, the decisions are not sexual, they're aesthetic. We may consider these activities trivial, but every time we appear in public, we're making complex statements about ourselves, by the way we groom ourselves, adorn our bodies and select our clothes. Clothing is a major source of human display. Unlike body language or speech, it's long-lasting. A kind of frozen gesture that we go on making all day. The visual impact of a shaken fist lasts only as long as the arm is moving. But the visual impact of a costume lasts as long as we wear it. This is why, all around the globe, we find the same insistence on this kind of decoration in a thousand different forms. For certain individuals, an even more permanent form of body decoration is preferred. The possession of tattooed skin demonstrates a willingness to subject oneself to prolonged pain in order to display a particularly elaborate form of body decoration. The discomfort of having this form of adornment applied is compensated for by the fact that it never has to be reapplied. It's there for life. No one can ever steal this shirt off your back, and the laundry can never lose it. Even in normally fully clothed societies, the urge to decorate the body in dramatic ways is more widespread than one might imagine. Because it displays the courage to suffer voluntary pain and because for some it demonstrates intense, unchanging loyalty to the group, body mutilation has managed to survive even in modern Western societies. Beyond tattooing, there's actual body piercing. The most common form is ear piercing for earrings, although this has recently been joined by the more exotic nose piercing and even nipple piercing. Every time we go out on the town, we like to get dressed up. It makes us feel good. But why? Why do we go to so much trouble to decorate our bodies? The answer is that it fulfills a deep-seated need to make us feel special. But what does this imply? Here in Africa, the Ndebele people are renowned for their elaborately patterned homes. Instead of snoozing in the sun, they express the complexity of their human brains with creative acts. They spend hours painting and repainting their houses with meticulously executed abstract designs. They've not merely occupied this territory, they've transformed it. The painted surfaces act like advertising hoardings for the human species, saying, we've imposed ourselves on this place, we've brought order here, we've tamed the environment, and we've done this with great effort and skill. This is a status display, not just for individual artists, but for the human animal as a whole. Occasionally, even in the modern city, there's a small rebellion against the dead hand of the city planners. And creativity forces its way back onto bleak urban surfaces. Here in Vienna, an Austrian artist was given the opportunity to transform an insipid corner of the city into a work of art. On the Hunterwasser house, each window differs from its neighbours. There are irregular lines everywhere, defying tradition.
So Huntervasa is introducing natural curved lines into the artificial world of the city, whereas the Endobili are introducing geometry into their natural world. The key to their creativity in both cases is contrast with the environment. Wherever you look, native crafts reflect this rule, geometric shapes being more surprising and therefore more special when seen against a rugged background. In the same way, this gentle landscape with its soft natural lines, hanging on the wall of an austere, geometrically designed city boardroom, is made special by its deliberate irrelevance. As you move from culture to culture, you find the focus of creativity repeatedly relocates itself. If it's not on the bodies or the buildings, where could it be? For many societies, it comes to rest on the local vehicles. Here in Sicily, it appears on the donkey carts, which are treated like precious icons. Every square inch is decorated with elaborate detail, involving many hours of painstaking labour. On small islands with long fishing traditions, it's the fishing boats that become the local works of art. In Malta, the fishermen carefully repaint their boats every year. The local colour traditions influence the fishermen to make their boats look similar to one another, but each man also imposes his own personality on the paintwork. In fact, when I analysed the colour patterns of 400 of these boats, I found that no two are exactly the same. This principle of variations on a theme is one of the most fundamental properties of works of art. Sometimes varying a theme becomes an obsession. Just how exaggerated can you make your variations? Just how far can you go with a decorated car? These amazing vehicles are the ultimate expression of the urge to make the ordinary and commonplace into something extraordinary and special. What about more reserved societies? Well, here in Britain, a vivid form of visual art does still exist, but it's found a new location. It's shifted to the gardens. Keen gardeners may not think of themselves as serious artists, but that's precisely what they are. The skillful design of their flower beds having as their main function aesthetic display. So although most of the time we may appear drab, there's usually a corner of each human life where we rebel and strike out with a colourful display. When a peacock displays, it's obeying what's been called the handicap principle. The huge tail is a grave disadvantage to the bird, making it cumbersome and conspicuous. Any male who can survive despite its tail must clearly be a very fit and powerful individual, and this appeals to the females. It's the same for us. If we take the trouble to display ourselves, like this, we send out signals saying, we can afford to do this. Ostentatious displays of clothing, hairstyles, cars or houses all help to emphasise the way we've risen above the level of mere survival. If we can spare the energy to be special, then we must have the ordinary under control. Well, you may think, this doesn't apply to me. I like to keep life simple. I'm not interested in all this arty, fashionable nonsense. Well, I doubt it. Somewhere in every life, aesthetic decisions are being made. 
even the most uncolourful male, for example, occasionally has to face the problem of choosing a new tie. Our hidden camera watched this man trying to select one. Now, the modern tie is an article of clothing that has no practical function whatever. The difference between one tie and another is purely aesthetic. He may not have designed the ties himself, but he still has to choose one. And in that act of choosing, just for a moment, he becomes an artist. In our high-speed world today, we often let other people make the designs for us and limit our own impact to the matter of selecting from a ready-made range. In a more primitive culture, if primitive is the right word, we'd be making the designs ourselves. But today, we're often driven to being artists by proxy. Mass production may blunt our aesthetic choices, but it certainly doesn't eliminate them. It's the same when we choose a car. We know all about their technical qualities, but we're still strongly influenced by tiny differences in appearance, in body shape, colour and style, in the aesthetics of car design. And our sensitivity to these differences often leads to interminable dithering. Again, when we spend ages studying a menu, what we're really doing is making aesthetic decisions about aroma, taste and texture. In fact, if we really stop to examine our behaviour, it soon becomes clear that we all make hundreds of small aesthetic decisions every day. And the faces of people as they make these decisions show intense concentration. It would seem that we've all inherited a deep-seated urge to look for more in the world around us than just simple, practical things. This compulsion is so universal, it must surely be part of our basic biology. And if it's so strong, it's reasonable to suppose that it's also very ancient. But just how ancient? Long before human beings walked the Earth, there existed a small ape-man species, Australopithecus. Often referred to as the missing link between ourselves and other primates, they lived here. This cave in the Transvaal in southern Africa was home to these prehumans a very long time ago. And it was here that a remarkable discovery was made. Inside the cave was found the oldest art object in the world. It's called the Makapan pebble. And it's made of a stone that is only found three miles north of here. So the eight men had to carry it all that distance back here to their home in the cave. So for them, it was obviously a treasured possession. Now, this is it. And uh, at first sight, it's not very impressive. But to see why they were excited by it, I only have to turn it around. And then a face appears. And what's really remarkable is that this wasn't happening a few hundred years ago or a few thousand years ago but three million years ago. Moving north to the Middle East, to the much disputed Golan Heights, a startling discovery was made only a few months ago that has rewritten the history of art. For here was found the world's oldest man-made art object. The Makapan pebble was a found art object, but the 300,000-year-old Golan Venus has clearly been shaped by human hand. A flint tool has been used to make an incised neck and arms. Although crudely fashioned, this tiny female figurine is a quarter of a million years older than its nearest rival. To find something more impressive, we have to jump forward in time to the exciting rock art that's scattered all over the globe. For nearly 50,000 years, native Australians have been creating symbolic images on the rocks. Each season they had to be repainted to renew their spirit powers, and so that the artists could share in that power. It was thought that this practice had died out, but the tradition still manages to survive, although it's not been filmed for many years. 
So as far as we can tell, the phenomenon that we today call art has always been part of human existence, as universal as eating, sleeping or talking. Even our ancient ancestors, who lived the most primitive lives by our standards, spent valuable time creating magnificent pictures. The fact is that creativity has always been an essential part of our makeup. But where did this ancient artistic impulse in human beings spring from originally? Are we the only animal species with creative urges? This strange sculpture is built not by a human artist, but by a bird, the Vogelkop gardener bird. During the breeding season, the male clears an area of forest floor and constructs a remarkable woven hut from sticks and grasses. Below the hut, he makes his garden, laying down a lawn of moss, on which are placed hundreds of carefully collected objects, such as seed shells, bulbs, fruits or flowers. These are grouped together in discrete, segregated clusters, according to shape and colour. This display may attract a female, but is it creative? Well, he certainly creates a contrast between the neatness of his garden and the wild tangle of the forest. But he never attempts to experiment or develop the theme of his display. His work may be extraordinary, but it lacks the curiosity and inventiveness of human art. To trace the biological origins of human art, it's necessary to turn to our nearest living relatives, the apes. It was back in the 1950s that I began to study the picture-making abilities of a young chimpanzee called Congo. When offered painting materials, he filled the space available to him, but did not go beyond that space. His favourite pattern was a radiating fan shape. Once he'd invented this, he started to vary it. He was demonstrating that most essential element of all art, thematic variation. Okay. If a small square was placed in the middle of the paper, instead of spreading his lines out, Congo concentrated them in that region. And this wasn't a one-off accident. It happened time and time again. Even more remarkable, if the central square was placed over to one side, Congo balanced it with heavier markings on the opposite side of the paper. And if a square was placed at the top of the paper, it was balanced with markings at the bottom. So the chimpanzee has the beginnings of an aesthetic sense. And it's easy to see from this the primate origins of the art that we observe unfolding in our own human children. All over the world, regardless of their background, all children enjoy making the same kinds of scribbles. At this stage, there are a few differences between the art of chimp and child. The scribbles are visually controlled, but they're completely abstract. But then order is brought to this chaos. A clean circle is distilled from the jumble of squiggles. It's crisscrossed in various ways and eventually grows a ring of small radiating lines. Now something magical happens. A face emerges. There's a sudden flash of recognition, something like the moment when our ape-man ancestors first saw that face on the Macapan pebble. Faces quickly become people. They develop arms, legs and bodies, and more and more details are added. A huge threshold has been passed, one that no chimpanzee has yet managed. Pictorial representation has been achieved. A whole new world of experimentation opens up. Human creativity is unleashed. It's amazing that even at this stage, the images are still universal. Cultural differences and local traditions have yet to make their impact. The figures being created come from inside the child's imagination, with hardly any outside influences. It's as though our whole species is programmed to pass through this stage of unfolding imagery, just as we're all programmed to start developing speech at about the same time. It's tempting to say that the urge to do these things is part of our ancient biology, rather than our recent culture. 
the sequence is always the same. Early lines and scribbles become looping circles, and gradually these circles are refined and distilled into just one. Then the circle is marked. It's crossed with lines until they're sprouting out like the rays of the sun. Small circles and lines are added inside the big circle and become organised into features. The face then grows arms, legs and a body, and the human figure is born. As the young artists grow older, they devote their energies to creating more and more lifelike drawings. They no longer have the thrill of using their imaginations or of playfully taking a line for a walk. In contrast with their early efforts, when painting was its own reward, when it was a voyage of visual discovery, they're now burdened with an arduous new task, that of copying an object from real life. Art no longer invents, it imitates. As young adults, we're trained to make our copies of nature more and more accurate. And we're only rewarded if we can succeed with this new skill. Most people give up art altogether at this stage because the childlike joy has gone out of it. Art's become the slave of historical record. Over the centuries, great art became more and more the brilliant work of the elite few. Ordinary people couldn't compete with this. And the artist, now taken seriously by society, became its visual historian. But then science entered the scene. Photography was invented, to be followed by film and video. The burden of visual recording was lifted from the shoulders of the artist. As a result, 20th century art has gradually thrown off its representational chains and little by little has returned to the joyous visual explorations of the small child. But it's done this with an adult maturity and sophistication. In place of skillful but slavish copying, there's once again unhindered creativity. For some, steeped in earlier traditions, this has been a bewildering change of direction but it's merely art returning to its imaginative, playful roots. And sometimes, this playfulness takes an unexpected turn. Thanks, you guys. Thanks, you too. I appreciate it. No, it's hard work. <laughs> Great the Checks side. in the mail. Great into the side room. Looks good. And yeah, thank you, people. Yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah. Almost all mammals are playful when they're young but their playfulness fades as they grow older. If they're well fed, adult lions, for example, never play. Instead, they sleep for 16 hours every day. This is a key difference from humans. Human children are just as playful as lion cubs, but their playfulness does not fade. It survives into adulthood. Individuals that play a great deal when young are better at surviving later in life. It's intriguing that so much of childhood play takes the form of prey-predator behaviour, as though we feel the need to act out our ancient past. Ready or not, here I come! 
early playfulness, although not a specific training course, gives children a greater understanding of their personal abilities and the properties of their environment. For the human child, a narrow, inactive life can be a disaster. To be really successful as an adult, they must ideally be super active in childhood. And it's their natural playfulness that encourages this, and under normal circumstances, ensures that it will happen. Incredibly, this playfulness begins in the womb. An ultrasound scan of this human embryo reveals playful actions even at this tender age. The baby is kicking its legs not for any specific physiological reason, but because it's playing with rhythm and with its body. So playfulness seems to be very basic to our species, and there are lessons to be learnt from this. One lesson is that as adults, when we're given a stimulating environment and a playful atmosphere, we perform at our best. This may sound obvious, but it's usually overlooked. The management at this Los Angeles advertising agency has, however, taken a drastic step and acted on this idea. Hey, there's an idea. Their young executives are surrounded by cuddly toys and games of all kinds. Their minds are encouraged to wander on the principle that most great ideas happen almost by accident. Clients are surprised to find the creative staff playing basketball while discussing multi-million dollar campaigns. But these are techniques that, far from interfering with novel thought processes, foster them. Unfortunately, for most of us, the daily routine is far less novel than this. We compensate by allowing ourselves an occasional orgy of playfulness. Special occasions when we dress up and become unashamedly childlike again. In almost every corner of the globe, it's possible to find elaborate, time-consuming events that have little meaning other than to allow for an outburst of intense playfulness. The Finnish town of Rovaniemi enjoys an annual snow-carving contest. These ice sculptures take days to create, and then, after they've been completed and enjoyed, they're simply allowed to melt away. Each environment dictates its own brand of adult playfulness. On a Dutch beach, the world's largest sandcastle, towering to a height of 70 feet, has been painstakingly constructed out of nothing more than sand and water. Here, adults have cheerfully stolen a typical children's seaside game and, by expending a great deal of effort and skill, have converted it into a kind of folk art. There's no lasting art object here, merely an exuberant, ephemeral expression of human inventiveness. It's the actions, the event, that's all important. Once the goal has been achieved, the sand is returned to its normal condition. The game is over for another year. It may seem a shame to destroy it, but the brevity of its appearance is part of its magic. All over the world, adults refuse to leave game playing to the children. Sport becomes a serious activity, whether as a participant or as an observer. For millions of people, this has become the major form of play, watching rather than doing. This is playing by proxy. <laughs> Come on! Oh. Albertini to his right. Oh, yes! Oh, he's hit oh, no. the post. Oh, hit the side. Oh, no. It's got to be in the side. Yes! yes! Hey! Yeah. But you're not laughing now, are you? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Much of human playfulness is testing out potential, gaining experience in as many ways as possible. In other words, being prepared. This is important because we human beings are non-specialists. We're opportunists have to take any small advantage that's going and must therefore make ourselves well aware of both our environment and our own abilities.
We survive not by having one big trick, but by having lots of small tricks. For example, many other species are specialist feeders, relying on a single source of food. But during our evolution, we never knew where our next meal was coming from. We always had to be on the lookout for any new source of sustenance. In this way, we were able to adapt to almost any environment. But this often involved us in taking risks. For a risk-taking species, we're not really physically very well equipped. We're not protected by a hard shell or a thick hide or, or a shaggy coat. Our naked bodies with their soft skin and fleshy feet are exposed and vulnerable. But it's amazing what we can make them do. This little girl's dilemma sums up the human condition. Under the watchful eye of her father, she's facing a new challenge. Part of her is desperate to jump from this high platform, even though there's no special reason for her to do so, while another part of her is scared to take the plunge. This conflict is present in all of us throughout our lives, when to jump and when to play it safe. For these older children, the risks on this raft ride were a little too tame, so they deliberately create additional problems. The human animal always likes to raise the stakes just a little bit and push the limits just a little further. danger become the key to excitement for some people, like these train-riding sophistas in Brazil, who risk their lives just for the thrill of escaping death. Here one sees the playful face of human bravery, and the urge to satisfy the human need to push experiences to the absolute limit. And you can't go much further than dodging high-voltage electric cables on top of a speeding train. In recent years, groups have been formed with the express purpose of taking risks. The members of these strange clubs spend a great deal of time and money trying to devise new ways of risking their lives. This human catapulter may appear to most of us to be a weird eccentric. But in reality, we do much the same sort of thing every time we risk shooting a traffic light as it changes colour. For those who fear taking physical risks, there are always alternatives available. In many countries, there are gambling halls where the minor risk of losing a little money can be enjoyed. The risk-taking in these pachenko parlors may seem monotonous to outsiders, but thousands of Japanese indulge in this type of dangerous living every day. Risk-taking is not a purely modern phenomenon. It's been a human preoccupation for thousands of years. 
for these Fijian firewalkers, deliberately risking physical pain long ago became elevated to the status of a religious ceremony. If a handkerchief were placed on these stones, it would burst into flames. To this day, nobody knows how injury to the soles of the feet is avoided in this ancient form of firewalking. This is risk-taking in its purest and most magical form. The human species has always enjoyed playing with fire, but never perhaps quite so literally as this. Surely the strangest game of football in the world. There's little risk of handball here, unless of course you happen to be the unfortunate goalkeeper. The game continues until, at last, the referee blows up for full time. One of the most important properties of play is that it contains an element of make-believe. When a kitten pounces on a leaf, that leaf symbolises a mouse, and the young cat accepts the leaf as a victim of a hunt, and treats it as one, even though it's obvious that it's not. When he was asked why he'd written the words, this is not a pipe, underneath this particular image, René Magritte replied, well, you can't stuff tobacco into this pipe, so it isn't really a pipe at all. The point he was making is that the image is not the thing that it represents. We're all capable of making this symbolic equation, of letting one thing stand for another, of reacting to something as though we really believe in it, whilst at the same time knowing that it's only make-believe. This isn't just the basis of a great deal of human visual art. It's also the basis of words and literature. The word dog, for example, never bit anybody. And symbolic play is, of course, widespread in adult life. Whole industries are based upon it. When we go to the cinema, we're entering a world of pretend. Here, a hidden camera records the facial expressions of people watching a torture scene from a violent film. They know that what they're seeing is being performed by actors, but they clearly experience acute reactions to what they're witnessing as if it were real. In the past, people have sometimes planned their whole future on the basis of symbols. In more superstitious times, magical symbols were thought to carry such amazing powers that complicated ceremonies were woven around them. Here, in rituals that may last for up to four days, Navajo Indians create sand paintings with complex meanings. Every shape, every colour, every image has a special symbolic significance. The paintings are made by carefully dropping granules of coloured pigment onto the sand bed. Once they've been completed, the individual who is the focus of the ritual sits in the centre of the painting. The songs and chants, the magical images soak up her troubles and spirit them away. It's tempting to say, but these are only sand pictures. How can anyone imagine that they have real influence? But then, how can anyone imagine that an actor in a film is really being tortured? Once we enter the world of symbolic thinking, we become suggestible to an amazing degree. Whole mythologies have been constructed on the foundation of just a few symbolic equations. Whether they're true or false is hardly relevant. 
Their importance is in the way they transport us onto new planes of experience and release us into the heady world of brain games and mind play. As soon as our basic needs are satisfied, as soon as we've gone beyond survival, we're off and running. The naked ape should really be rechristened the creative ape. At our best, we remain all our lives childlike adults, ready at the slightest excuse to indulge in mature play. To many people, our greatest achievements are to be found in the realms of such pursuits as technology, medicine, politics and economics. But to me, these are merely means to one of two ends, either better human survival or better adult play. If ever we give this up and all become depressingly earnest, pious adult adults, we'll have betrayed our great biological heritage as the most exuberant, most mischievously imaginative animal on this planet. Above all else, the lesson to be learned from the biological study of human beings is that we are part of nature. We're not above it, we're an integral part of it. The human animal, in many respects, as we've seen repeatedly in this series, is very much like other animals. But in a few important respects, we're very, very different. And it's these differences that have made us the dominant animal on the planet. Of all the millions of species that have ever lived, we, the human animal, are by far the most extraordinary. We're the magic combination, the threshold leaper, the risk taker, the venerable child for all occasions. Thank you.